Mary Slusser of Calabar, Pioneer Missionary by W.P. Livingston. Chapter 10 How House and Hall Were Built. She was impatient to have a house of her own, but the natives were slow to come to her assistance. They thought the haste she exhibited was undignified and smiled compassionately upon her. There was no hurry. There never is in Africa. If she would but wait, all would be well. When argument failed, they went off and left her to cut down the bush and dig into the roots herself. Lounging about in the village, they commiserated a mother who was so strong-headed and willful, and consoled themselves with the thought of the work they would do when once they began. She could make no progress, and there was nothing for it but to tend the sick, receive visitors, mend the rags of the village, cut out clothing for those who developed a desire for it, and look after her family of barons. One day, however, the spirit moved the people, and they flocked to the ground. She constituted herself architect, clerk of works, and chief laborer. Her idea was to construct a number of small mud huts and sheds, which would eventually form the back buildings of the mission house proper. Four tree trunks with forked tops were driven into the ground, and upon them laid other logs. Bamboos, crossed and recrossed, and covered with palm mats, formed the roof and veranda. Upright sticks, interlaced and dowed with red clay, made the walls. Two rooms, each eleven feet by six, with a shaded veranda, thus came into existence. Then a shed was added to each end, making three sides of a square. Fires were kept blazing day and night in order to dry the material and to smoke it as a protection against vermin. Drains were dug and the surrounding bush cleared. In one of the rooms she put a fireplace of red clay, and close to it a sideboard and dresser of the same material. Holes were cut out for bowls, cups, and other dishes, and rubbed with stone until the surface was smooth. The top had an edge to keep the plates from falling off, and was polished with a native black dye. Her next achievement was a mud sofa, where she could recline, and a seat near the fireside, where the cook could sit and attend to her duties. In the other room she deposited her boxes, books, and furniture. Hanging upon the post were pots and pans and jugs, and her alphabet and reading sheets. In front stood her sewing machine, rusty and useless, after its exposure in the damp air. There also at night was a small organ, which during the day occupied her bed. Such was the caravan, as Mary called it, which was her dwelling for a year. A wonderful house, it seemed to the people of Okyung, who regarded it with astonishment and awe. To herself it was a delight. Never had the building of a home been watched with such loving interest. And when it was finished, no palace held a merrier family. At meals all sat round one pot. Spoons were a luxury, none required, and never had food tasted so sweet. There were drawbacks. All the cows, goats, and fowls in the neighborhood, for instance, seemed to think the little open yard was the finest rendezvous in the village. Her next thought was for the church and schoolhouse. A mistress of missionary strategy, she wished to build this at Ifaco, in order that she might control a larger area, but the chiefs for long showed no interest in the matter. One morning, however, an Ifaco boy sought her with the message, My master wants you. She thought the command somewhat peremptory, but went. To her surprise, she found the ground cleared, posts, sticks, and mud ready, and the chiefs waiting her orders. She designed a hall, thirty feet by twenty-five, with two rooms at the end for her own use, in case storm or sickness or palavar should prevent her going home. Work was started, and not a single slave was employed in the carrying of the materials or in the construction. King Eoi sent the mats, some thousands in number, for the roof, and free women carried them the four miles from the beach, plastered the walls, molded the mud seats, beat the floor, and cleared up, and all cheerfully, without thought of reward. Doors and windows were still wanting, but she asked for the services of a carpenter from Calabar to do this bit of work, and meanwhile the humble building, the first ever erected for the worship of God in Okyung, was formally opened. It was a day of days for the people. Mary had prepared them for it, and all appeared in their new Sunday attire, which, in many cases, consisted of nothing more than a clean skin. But the contents of various mission boxes had been kept for the occasion, and the children, after being washed, were decked to the first time in garments of many shapes and colors. The wearing of a garment, said Mary, never fails to create self-respect. It was a radiant and excited company that gathered in the hall. There was perhaps little depth in their emotion, 
but she regarded the event as a step toward better things. Her idea was to separate the day from the rest, and make it a means of bringing about cleanliness and personal dignity, while it also imposed upon the people a little of that discipline which they so much needed. The chiefs were present, and they voluntarily made the promise before all that the house would be kept sacred to God in her service, the slave women and children would be sent to it for instruction, and that no weapon of warfare would be carried into it, and that it would be a sanctuary for those who fled to it for refuge. Services and day school were now held regularly in the hall. The latter was well attended, all the pupils showed eagerness to learn book, and many made rapid progress. The larger mission house, which Mary intended to occupy the space in front of the yard at Ekenge, was a stiffer problem for the people, and for a time they hung back from the attempt to build it. Chapter 11 A Palavar at the Palace Perhaps the greatest obstacle to a Christian truth and progress was not superstition or custom, but drink. She had seen something of the traffic in rum and gem of the coast, but she was amazed at what went on in Okiang. All in the community, old and young, drank, and often she lay down to rest at night knowing that not a sober man and hardly a sober woman was within miles of her. When the villagers came home from a drunken bout, the chief men would rouse her up and demand why she had not risen to receive them. At all hours of the day and night they would stagger into the hut and lie down and fall asleep. Her power then was not strong enough to prevent them. But the time came. The spirit came up from Calabar, and was the chief article of trade. When a supply arrived, processions of girls trooped in from all quarters, as if they were going to the spring for water. At the funeral of one big man, seven casks of liquor was consumed, in addition to that bought in small quantities by the poor classes. A refugee of good birth and conduct remarked to Mary once that he had been there three days in the yard, and had not tasted the white man's rum. Three days, she replied. "'And you think that long?' "'Ma,' he said, in evident astonishment, three whole days. "'I have never passed a day without drinking since I was a boy.' She fought this evil with all her energy and skill. Her persuasion so wrought on the chiefs that on several occasions they agreed to put away the drink at Palavar's, with the result that those who had come from a distance departed, sober and in peace, to the wonderment of all. She saw that the people were tempted, and fell because of their idleness and isolation for they still maintained their aloofness from all their neighbors, and there was yet no free communication with Calabar. If a missionary happened to pay her a visit, he would be stopped on the forest track by sentries who, after satisfying themselves as to his identity, cooed to other watchers farther on. Dr. Livingston believed that the opening up of Central Africa to trade would help to stamp out the slave traffic, and in the same way she was convinced that more legitimate commerce and the development of wants among the people would to some extent undermine the power of drink. All the ordinary trade she had done so far was the sale of five shillings worth of handkerchiefs and a sixpence looking-glass. She urged the chiefs to make the initiative and was never tired of showing them her possessions, in order to incite within them a desire to own similar articles. They were greatly taken with the glass doors and windows, and one determined to procure wood and shut himself in. Her clock, sewing machine, and organ were always a source of wonder, and people came from far and near to see them. The women quickly became envious of her household goods, and she could have sold her bed covers, curtains, meat safe, bedstead, chest of drawers, and other objects a score of times. More promising still was their desire to have clean dresses like their ma, and she spent a large portion of her time cutting out and shaping the long, simple garments that served to cover their nakedness. She also sent down to Calabar and asked some of the native trading people whom she knew to come up with cloth, pots and dishes, and other useful articles, guaranteeing them her protection. But so great was their fear of the Okiang warriors, and so poor their faith in her power, that they refused point-a-blank. They would as soon have thought of going to the moon. Well, said Mary, if they won't come to us, we must go to them. She had been seeking to familiarize the minds of the chiefs with the idea of settling their disputes by means of arbitration instead of by fighting, and had been cherishing the hope that she might persuade some of them to proceed to Creektown and discuss the subject with King Iwe. She now proposed to the king that he should invite them to Impalavar at his house, and at the same time she would endeavor to have some produce sent down direct to the traders. The king had never ceased to take an interest in her work. He frequently sent up special messengers to inquire if all was well, and always reminded her that he was willing to be of service to the Okiang people. 
A grandson of the first Kinyoi, who also sent men occasionally with instructions to do anything they could for the White Maw and to bring down her messages to Calabar. Such kindly thought often took the edge off her loneliness. The king at once sent the invitation, and trusting more in the word of Mary than in that of the king, all the chiefs in the neighborhood accepted the offer, and an expedition to Creektown was organized. A canoe was obtained and heaped with yams and plantains, gifts for the king, and with bags of palm kernels and a barrel of oil, the first installment of trade with the Europeans. Alas, the natives knew nothing about a load line, and as the tide rose, the canoe sank. It was not an unmixed pleasure setting out with the men, who were ignorant of the management of canoes, but another day was fixed, and another canoe was found. The whole of Okyang seemed to be at the beach, and every man, woman, and child was uttering counsel and heartening the intrepid voyagers. Several of the chiefs drew back and disappeared, and of the half-dozen who remained, only two could be persuaded to embark when they learnt that guns and swords must be left behind. "'Ma, you make a woman of us. Did ever a man go to a strange place without his arms?' Ma was not changing. She sat down and waited, and after two hours' palavar, swords were ungirt and handed with the guns to the women. Those who still declined to go were received back with rejoicing, and farewells were made to those who went, amidst wailings and tears. A start was made, but the craft proved to be ill-balanced, and the cargo had to be shifted. As this was being done, she detected a number of swords hidden below the bags of colonels. Her eyes flashed, and the people scattered out of the way as she pitched the arms out on the beach. With a meekness that was amusing, the men scrambled into their places, and the canoe shot into the river. Mary took a paddle and wielded it with the best of the men. The journey was made through dense darkness and drizzling rain, and occupied twelve hours. But she was rewarded by the result. Nothing could exceed the kindness of King Ioi. He bore himself as a Christian gentleman, listening courteously to the passionate and foolish speech of the Okyang representatives, reminding the supercilious Calabar chiefs that the gospel which had made them what they were had only just been taken to Okyang, and in giving the verdict which went against them, he gently made it the findings of righteousness according to the laws of God. When all had been settled, he asked Mary to take the chiefs over to his palace, and invited them to a meeting in the church in the evening, where he spoke words of cheer and counsel from the words to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. This experience made a great impression upon the chiefs. They left with a profound reverence for the king and a determination to abide by his decisions in the future, whilst Mary had added much to her dignity and position. This was proved the morning after they returned to Ekenj. She was awakened by a confused noise, and on looking out was astonished to find several chiefs directing slaves who were working with building materials. "'What is the matter?' she asked in wonder. Instead of answering her, one of the chiefs, who had accompanied her to Calabar, turned to the crowd, and in a burst of eloquence, described all he had seen at Creektown, how the Europeans lived, and how King Eoy and every chief and gentleman had treated their mother as a person superior to them, and gave her all honor. They and Okyong must now treat her as benefited her rank and station, and must build her a proper house to live in. Mary was hard put to preserve her gravity.' Soon afterwards a young slave, for whom she had often pled, began to wash his hands in some dirty water in a dish outside. His master ran at him with a whip, and it was all she could do to prevent him being lashed. Opening out again and again, he called the lad a fool for daring to touch dish used by the great white mother. But what was more important than all was the fact that the way had been at last opened to trade relations with Calabar. The Bihipo began to make oil and buy and sell kernels, and to sell the produce down the river direct to the factories. As she had foreseen, they now had less time for palavars, and less inclination for useless drinking, and still more useless quarreling and fighting. Chapter 12 The Scottish Carpenter The story of the settlement in Okyong and of the building of the hut and hall was related by Miss Lesser in the missionary record of the church for March 1889. The hall she described as a beautiful building, though neither doors nor windows were yet put in, as we were waiting for a carpenter. And, she added, if there was only a house built, any other agent could come and take up the work if I fail. In the same number of the record there appeared an appeal for the Foreign Mission Committee for a practical carpenter with an interest in Christian work for Calabar. 
There happened to be in Edinburgh at this time a carpenter named Mr. Charles Ovens, belonging to the Free Church, who was keenly interested in foreign missions. As a boy, he had wished to be a missionary, but believing that only ministers could hold such a post, he relinquished the idea. He was an experienced tradesman of the fine old type, a Scot of Scots, with the happy knack of looking on the bright side of things. Having been in America on a prolonged visit, he was about to return there, and had gone to say good-bye to an old lady friend, a United Presbyterian. The latter remarked to him, "'I see Miss Slusser wants a man to put in doors and windows. Why don't you go to Calabar?' He had never heard of Miss Lusser, but the suggestion struck him as good, and he straightway saw the foreign mission secretary, and then went and changed the address on his baggage. He left in May, and on his arrival in Calabar, was sent up to finish the work Mary had begun. All his speech at Duke Town was of America and its wonders, but when he returned some months later, he could talk of nothing but Okiang. He found Mary attired in a simple dress, without hat or shoes, dining at a table in the yard in the company of goats and hens. She sprang up with delight on hearing the Scot's tongue, and welcomed him warmly. The conditions were more primitive, and his room was only eight feet long and five feet wide, but he possessed much of her Spartan spirit. Although ignorant of the native tongue, he was of great assistance to her during his stay, while his humor and irresistible laugh lightened many a weary day. As he worked, he sang old Scots songs, like the Rowan Tree, and when she heard the latter, tears came to her eyes at the memories it recalled. Even Tom, his native assistant, was affected. I don't like these songs, he said. They make my heart big and my eyes water. The mission house had progressed well under Mary's superintendence. She had aimed at making it equal to any at the big stations, and had planned an upstairs building with a veranda six feet above the ground, and a kitchen and dispensary. She had mudded the walls, and the mat roof was being tied on. And now that Mr. Owens was at work, all was promising well, when an event occurred which put a stop to operations for months. Chapter 13 Her Greatest Battle and Victory One morning, when nature was as lovely as a dream, Mr. Ovens was working at the new house, and Miss Lesser was sitting on the veranda watching him. Suddenly, from far away in the forest, there came a strange, eerie sound. Ever on the alert for danger, Mary rose and listened. "'There's something wrong,' she exclaimed. For a moment she stood in the tense attitude of a hunter, seeking to locate the quarry, and then, swiftly moving to the forest, vanished from sight. Mr. Upin sent Tom, his assistant, after her, to find out what was the matter. He returned with the message that there had been an accident and that Mr. Ovens was to come at once and bring restoratives. As the ominous news became known to the natives standing around, a look of fear came into their faces. Mr. Ovens found her sitting beside the unconscious body of a young man. It is Etim, the eldest son of our chief, Etim, she explained. He was about to be married it, and had been building a house. He came here to lift and bring a tree. When handling the tree, it slipped and struck him on the back of the neck and paralysis has ensued. He glanced at her face as if surprised at its gravity. She divined what he thought, and speaking out of her intimate knowledge of the people and their ways, she said, There's going to be trouble. No death of a violent character comes apart from witchcraft. Can you make some sort of litter to carry? Divesting himself a part of his clothing and obtaining some strong sticks, he made a rough stretcher on which the inert form was laid and conveyed to Ekenge. For a fortnight Mary tended the patient in his mother's house, hoping against hope that he would recover, and that the crisis she dreaded would be averted. But he was beyond human help. One Sunday morning he lay dying, and the news sent a spasm of terror throughout the district. Hearing the sound of wailing, Mary rushed to the yard, and found the lad being held up, some natives blowing smoke into his nostrils, some rubbing ground powder into his eyes, others pressing his mouth open and his uncle, at Pinyang, shouting into his ears. Such treatment naturally hastened the end. When life was fled, the chief dropped the body into her arms and shouted, Sorcerers have killed, and they must die. Bring the witch doctor. At the words, every man and woman disappeared, leaving only the mother, who in an agony of grief cast herself down beside the body. When the medicine man arrived, he laid the blame of the tragedy upon a certain village, to which the armed free men at once marched. They seized over a dozen men and women, the others escaping to the forest, 
and after sacking all the houses returned with the prisoners loaded with chains, and fastened them to posts in the yard, which had only one entrance. Anxious to pacify the rage of the chiefs, father and mother, Mary undertook to do honor to the dead lad by dressing him in the style befitting his rank. Fine silk cloth was wound round his body, shirts and vests were put on. Over these went a suit of clothes which she had made for his father. The head was shaved into patterns and painted yellow, and round it was wound a silk turban, all being crowned with a tall black and scarlet hat with plumes of different feathers. Thus attired, the body was carried out into a booth in the woman's yard, where it was fastened, seated in an armchair under a large umbrella. To the hands were tied the whip and silver-headed stick that denoted his position, while the mirror was arranged in front of him, in order that he might enjoy the reflection of his grandeur. Beside him was a table upon which was set all the treasures of the house, including the skulls taken in war and a few candles begged for Mary. When the people were admitted and saw the weird spectacle, they became frenzied with delight, danced, and started on a course of drinking and wantonness. "'You'll have to stop our work,' Mary said to Mr. Evans, who felt as if he was moving in some grotesque fantasy of sleep. "'This is going to be a serious business. We can't leave these prisoners for a moment. I'll watch beside them all night, and you'll take the day.' And time and time about in that filthy yard, through the heat of the day and the chill of the night, these two brave souls kept guard opposite the wretched band of prisoners, with the half-naked people, armed with guns and machetes, dancing, drinking about them. As one barrel of rum was finished, another was brought in, and the supply seemed endless. The days went by, and Mr. Evans lost patience, and declared he would go and get a chisel and hammer and free the prisoners at all cost. "'Nay, nay,' replied Mary wisely, "'we'll have to have a little more patience.' One day she went to Mr. Evans and said, "'They want a coffin.' "'They'll have to make one,' he retorted. "'I think you'd better do it,' he rejoined. "'The boy's father has some wood of his own, "'of which he was going to make a door like mine, "'and he was willing to use it for the purpose. "'They proceeded to the yard to obtain measurements, "'and as they entered Mary caught sight of some Assyri beans "'lying on the pounded stone. "'She shivered. What could she do? "'She returned to her hut. "'Prayer had been her solace and strength "'during all these days and nights.' and now with passionate entreaty she beseeched God for guidance and help in the struggle that was to come. When she rose from her knees, her fear had vanished, and she was tranquil and confident. Reaching the yard, she took the two brother chiefs aside, and told them and told them that there must be no sacrifice of life. They did not deny that the poison ordeal was about to take place, but they argued that only those guilty of causing the death would suffer. She did not reply, but went to the door of the compound and sat down, for there she was determined not to move, until the issue was decided. The chiefs were angry. To have a white woman, and such a woman, amongst them was good, but she must not interfere with their customs and laws. The mother of the dead lad became violent. Even the slaves were openly hostile and threatening. The crowd, maddened by drink, ran wildly about, flourishing their guns and swords. "'Raise our master from the dead,' they cried, "'and you shall have the prisoners.' Night fell. Mr. Evans gathered up the children and put them to bed. Mary scribbled a note to Duke Town and gave it to the two native assistant carpenters, and directed them in English to steal in the darkness to the beach and make their way down the river. There was a distraction within the yard as well as without. Three of the women were mothers with babies, who were crying incessantly from hunger and fear. Another who had chains round her neck and bare limbs had an only daughter about fifteen years of age, who was a cousin of the dead lad and the betrothed wife of his father. The girl calling to her mother, weeping piteously. Sometimes she would come and clasp Ma's feet, beseeching her to help her, to waylay the chiefs, and offer herself in servitude for life in exchange for her mother's freedom. Mr. Evans had gone to the hut, and Mary was keeping a vigil when a stir warned her of danger. Several men came and unlocked the chains on one of the women, a mother, and ordered her to the front of the corpse to take the bean. Mary was in a dilemma. Was it a ruse to get her out of the yard? If she followed... Would they bar the entrance and wreck their vengeance on the others who remained? Do not go, they cried, and gazed at her pleadingly. But she could not see a woman walk straight to death. One swift appeal to God, and she was after the woman. The table was covered with a white cloth, and upon it stood a glass of water containing the poison. As the victim was in the act of lifting the glass, she touched her on the shoulder and whispered, Ethi'i, run. 
She gave a quick glance of intelligence into the compelling eyes, and off both bounded, and were in the bush before anyone realized they were gone. They reached the hut. Quick, Mary cried to Mr. Evans, take the woman and hide her. In a moment he had drawn her in and locked the door. Mary flew back to the yard. Where is she? the prisoners cried. Safe in my house, she answered. They were amazed. She herself wondered at her immunity from harm. It might be that the natives were stupefied with drink, but she thought of her prayer. Finding that she was not to be moved, the chiefs endeavored to conjole and deceive her. God will not let anybody die of the bean if they are not guilty, they said. They released two of the prisoners, substituting Imbium, the native oath, for the poison ordeal, and later five others. She stood firm, and two more obtained their freedom. There they stopped. We have done more for you than we have ever done for anyone, and we will die before we go further. Three remained. One woman with a baby they would not release. Akpo, the chief of her house, escaped into the bush, and the fact of his flight proves his guilt, they argued. We cannot ransom her. The other two, a freedman, and the woman named Inyem, with the daughter, was relatives of the bereaved mother, and also specially implicated, and they were seized and led away. Mary hesitated to follow, but hoping that the girl might be able to keep her informed of what was going on, she decided to remain with the woman with the infant. Another dawn brought visitors from a district, who only added to the rioting and her perplexity. They told her that Igbo was coming, and advised her to flee to Calabar. She replied that he could come and play the fool as much as he pleased, but she would not desert her post. The father stormed and threatened, and declared he would burn down the house. "'You are welcome,' she said. "'It is not mine.' In a blazing passion he cried that the woman would die. So terrified and exhausted was the victim that she begged Ma to give in. At this point Ma'imi came to the rescue. Kneeling to her brother, she besought him to allow Mary to have the prisoner in the meantime. She could be chained to the veranda of the hut, and could not possibly escape with such a weight of irons. Mary caught at the clan, and declared she would give a fair hearing to the charges against the house which she represented. To her infinite surprise, the chiefs gave in. But, said they, if she is sent out of the way to Calabar, you pay a heavy fine, and leave here for ever. Fearing they would repent, she hastily called for the keys to unlock the chain. But the slaves pretended ignorance, and said they could not find them, to denounce the liberation of the murderers. Patience and firmness again succeeded. The keys were produced, the locks were opened. Mary gathered up the long folds of chains, and Ma Amy, also trembling with eagerness, pushed them out in order that they might escape the crowd. They ran through the scrub to the hut, and here the mother and child were housed in a large packing case, while a barricade was put up to make the position more secure. During the afternoon, two of the Calabar missionaries arrived, and added the weight of their influence to Mary's, giving a magic lantern exhibition in the open, and in other ways endeavoring to lend prestige to the funeral, in order to compensate for the lack of human sacrifice. A quieter night followed, though the vigil was unbroken. In the morning the father of the dead lad called her aside, and in a long speech justified his desire to do his son honor by giving him a retinue in the spirit land. Then calling to his retainers, he ordered them to bring the free man. Dragging him forward, limping and dazed, he presented him formally to Ma, saying, This further act of clemency must satisfy you. The woman who is left must take the poison. You cannot object. She will recover if she is innocent. She thanked him warmly, but renewed her entreaties for the release of the woman also. The chief turned away in anger and disgust, and the battle went on. As the missionaries were obliged to return to Calabar, she and Mr. Ovens were again left alone. All day she followed the chief, coaxing and pleading. Sometimes he ignored her, sometimes he brusquely showed his annoyance, and sometimes he looked at her in pity, as if he thought she was crazy, and gave her no hope. When a whisper came to her ears that the burial would take place that night in the house of the chief, she was heartsick with dread. Late in the evening, as she was busy with her household, she heard a faint cry at the barricade. Ma! Ma! Make haste! Let me in! Noiselessly, she pulled aside the planks, and Inyam, heavily ironed, crawled on her hands and knees into the room. Her story was that she had managed by friction to cut one of the links of the chains which bound her, and had escaped by climbing the roof. Mary looked at the thick chain hanging about her, and guessed those were the kindly black hands that had given her aid, but she kept her thought to herself. The last of the prisoners were now safe. The funeral in the house of the chief had taken place, 
and only a cow had been placed in the coffin. Her joy was great, but her troubles were not over. A party of natives coming to the funeral met another party, returning drunk with excitement and rum. Recalling some old quarrel, the latter killed one of the men they met, cutting off his head and carried it away as a trophy. Fighting became general between the factions, and many were seriously wounded. One afternoon the village went suddenly mad with panic. All the women and children and all the men without arms rushed frantically about. Mothers clutched their babies. Wives and slaves seized with belongings they could carry. Children screamed and held on to the first person they met. They had heard sounds that heralded the advance of the dreaded Igbo. Then, by a common impulse, all rushed for the protection of the white woman's yard. She pulled down the barricade, packed as many women and children into her room as it could hold, and ordered the others into the bush at the back. The women were almost insane with terror, and the manacled prisoner begged to be killed. As the beating of the drum and the shouting of the mob drew near, Mary trembled. But again, prayer restored her to calm. Even when the village was invaded and shouting began, she was without fear. And strange to say, the mob re remained but a short time, and without a shot went home. They had set fire to every house in the village from which the prisoners had been taken, and wrecked another and burned the stock alive. As no powerful chief submitted to Igbo sent out by another house, Edom's village also ran amok, and for over a week the population haunted the forest, shooting down indiscriminately every man and woman who passed. It was not until much blood had been shed that the various bands became tired of the struggle and returned to their dwellings. For three weeks the prisoners were kept in the hut, and then Ma's pressure on the chief succeeded, and the chained woman was released on a condition that if her chief, Akpo, was caught, he would take the poisoner a deal, whilst Inyam, taking advantage of all the people being drunk one night, stole out into the forest and escaped. What became of her Mary never knew, until one day, months after, when traveling she passed a number of huts in the bush, and was accosted by name, and found herself face to face with the fugitive. This was the longest and severest strain to which she was subjected. It was her worst encounter with the passions of the natives. Her greatest conflict was the most terrible of their customs, and she came out of it victorious. For the first time in the dark history of the tribe, the death and funeral of one of the rank of a chief had occurred without the sacrifice of life. In some mysterious way, she had been able to subdue these wild people and bend them to her will. Her fame went far and wide throughout Ogyong, and beyond into regions still unexplored. And many thought of her with a kind of awe, as one possessing superhuman power. There were indeed some amongst those who knew her, who had a lurking suspicion that she was more than one.